Jesus said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them into the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. And you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. When's the last time you had to defend yourself? Not necessarily physically, but someone has attacked you, your reputation, said that you did something or said that you said something that maybe... Maybe you did or maybe you didn't, but you had to say, hey, listen, this is actually what happened. This is actually the truth of the situation. Have you been in something like that recently? Probably doesn't happen a whole lot, but if it ever has happened to you or if you've had to stand up for someone else who you've heard people maybe gossiping about, and you've said, actually, no, that's not true. I know them, and I was, or I was there, and that's not how it happened. That's not what's true. Do you know that feeling that maybe some of you are really bold and you've stood up and done that kind of stuff before? Maybe some of you are a little more just like, ah, it's not that big of a deal. You don't want to stand up and say stuff. Either way, you know that feeling you get when someone is being lied about, whether it be you or someone else that you know or love or respect, and just that feeling is like, that's wrong. That's not true. No, I know them or I know what happened. And you want to stand up and say something. Well, if you can get there, you know that feeling in your gut, like that is not how it happened. That's where Paul's at today. That's where we're at as we're in chapter 23 and 24 of this account, Acts. So what's happening in Acts is that it's an eyewitness testimony of the first 30 years of Christianity. So Jesus lived, died, arose, and ascended back to heaven establishing the gospel, finishing the work of salvation, and then he sends God the Holy Spirit as his agent to empower, strengthen, enlighten Christians to then go and make disciples. And so we've been walking through the book of Acts for like, this is our fifth year to go through a little bit of, a little chunk of it after Easter. And so now we're going to finish it out here in a few weeks. But we find ourselves in Acts 23. So this is 57 A.D., You can get your mind there. 33 AD is when Jesus lived, died, arose, ascended back to heaven. So this is 24 years later, and Paul has been on missionary journeys throughout, really for about 15 solid years, Paul was on missionary journeys, planting different churches as he took the gospel all over, mostly modern-day Turkey. If you look there, mostly all through Galatia and through... East Asia and Asia Minor in there. That's where Paul had gone. But now he has been arrested because he went back to Jerusalem. He was in the temple worshiping God. And these Jews who had heard about him, that he was preaching the gospel of Jesus, they didn't like him. So they were about to kill him. And this guy rescues him and then sends him north to Felix, who is a governor in Caesarea. So what's happening? Paul gets arrested. Let's just walk through the passage as quickly as we can, really it's a long passage, but make sure we understand what's going on and then we'll see what does that mean for us. Because there are two reasons this is in Acts. As, as it was being read to you, you may have thought like me, it's like, golly, this is a lot of information. A lot of, frankly, it seems like, why do we need to know this? <laughs> why do we need to know what, he, what the letter said that he sent to Felix? Well, we need to know it first of all because... It actually happened. This is eyewitness reportage of what actually happened. So it's in the Word of God because it happened, and we, we need to know it just to know what happened in Christianity and at the beginning as it, was, as it was being established. Secondly, we need to know this because it's written for our instruction. As God superintended the writing of Luke, as he was writing all this, this was included Ultimately, so we would know, yeah, but also so that we would be instructed in seeing this and seeing how Paul reacted to being charged with something that he didn't do or when the gospel is really on trial. 
So start with me in 2323. They called two centurions and said, Get ready 200 soldiers with 70 horsemen and 200 spearmen to go as far as Caesarea at the third hour of the night. It's 9 p.m. This is Claudius Lysias, who was a guy who was in charge in the Jerusalem area, who had protected Paul, make sure he wasn't going to get killed. And then while Paul was being held in prison, they figured out that 70 men had come under an oath that said, we will not eat until we kill Paul. And so this Claudius dude is like, ah, uh, he figured out that Paul was a Roman citizen and that if he lets a Roman citizen get killed by a bunch of, by an angry mob, this guy Claudius, he'll be killed too. That's how serious the law was. Paul was a Roman citizen. He's not just an Israelite. He is an Israelite, but also has this dual citizenship. So Claudius is like, oh, I got to get Paul out of Jerusalem. So he's going to send him to Felix. And he got these 470 men together to protect him. And he wrote a letter. Claudius Lysias to his excellency, the governor Felix. This man was seized by the Jews and was about to be killed by them when I came upon them with the soldiers and rescued him, having learned that he was a Roman citizen. See, he's, he's lying right there because he didn't know Paul was a Roman citizen. But in order to stop a riot, he took Paul away because these guys are about to riot. He takes Paul away, did not know he's a Roman citizen, and is about to have him flogged. He's about to have him beaten almost to death so that they'll figure out, why are all these guys so mad at you? And Paul, when he's being stretched out to be flogged, he looks back at the guys who, who are about to whip and he says, is it lawful for you to flog a Roman citizen without a trial? And it says they backed up and they're like, oh, because you can't do that to a Roman citizen and they would all be beheaded if they did that, if they did that to a Roman citizen without a trial. So Claudius, even in his writing to Felix, he says, like, you know, I, I rescued him. I found out he's a Roman citizen and I rescued him and I'm keeping him safe. That's not what he did. He's sending him away because he knows he's going to get killed if he doesn't, because if they want to kill Paul. Desiring to know the charge for which they were accusing him, I brought him down to their council. I found that he was being accused about questions of their law, not, but charged with nothing deserving of death or imprisonment. And when it, dis, it was disclosed to me that there would be a plot against the man, I sent him to you at once, ordering his accusers also to state before you what they have against him. So he's passing it on, passing Paul on. I don't want to deal with it. I don't want his blood to be on my hands if he gets killed, so I'm going to send him to the governor. So the soldiers, according to their instructions, took Paul and brought him by night to Antipatris. And on the next day, they returned to the barracks, letting the horsemen go on with him. So the guys on the horses returned back to Jerusalem. And when they had come to Caesarea and delivered the letter to the governor, they presented Paul also before him. On reading the letter, he asked what province he was from. So where are you from, Paul? And when he learned that he was from Cilicia... He said, I will give you a hearing when your accusers arrive. And it commanded him to be guarded in Herod's praetorium. In chapter 24, then after five days, the high priest Ananias came down with some elders and a spokesman, one Tertullus. Tertullus is a basically a guy that was hired by, the, by Ananias, the high priest in Israel, hired by them to be his lawyer, essentially, to be his accuser, to come in and make sure that this Roman governor Felix will want to put Paul to death. They laid before the governor their case against Paul, and when he had been summoned, Tertullus began to accuse him, saying, since through you, so he's talking to Felix, since through you we enjoy much peace, and since by your foresight, most excellent Felix, reforms are being made for this nation, in every way and everywhere, we accept this with all gratitude. So he's flattering Felix. You see that? He's saying, you're just so wonderful. I love you so much. Will you kill this guy for me? That's what's happening. But to detain you no further, I beg you in your kindness to hear us briefly. You don't need long to hear. Just kill him. For we have found this man a plague one who stirs up riots among all the Jews throughout the world and is a ringleader of the sect of the Nazarenes. Jesus was from Nazareth. So he doesn't call it Christianity or what it was called in this time, the way, capital W, way. 
They don't call it that. They say, this isn't the true fulfillment of Israel. This is a sect. This is a cult of the Nazarenes. This guy is stirring up all this kind of stuff. He's the ringleader of the sect of the Nazarenes. Verse 6, he even tried to profane the temple, but we seized him. By examining him yourself, you'll be able to find out from him about everything of which we accuse him. There's plenty of evidence for what we're saying. The Jews also joined in the charge, the guys who came with Tertullus and with Ananias, the high priest. And when the governor had nodded to him to speak, he, he heard their accusation, and now he turns to Paul and says, all right, speak. Paul replied, Knowing that for many years you have been a judge over this nation, I cheerfully make my defense. You can verify that it is not more than 12 days since I went up to worship in Jerusalem. And they did not find me dis disputing with anyone or stirring up a crowd, either in the temple or in the synagogues or in the city. Neither can they prove to you what they now bring up against me. But this I confess to you. He said, I'm not confessing what they're saying, but I will tell you this. But this I confess to you, that according to the way which they call a sect, it's talking about Christianity, who Jesus is, what he's done, how he saves people, and they are come together as the church. It was called the way back then more frequently. We call it just Christianity now. Through the way, or according to the way, which they call a sect, I worship the God of our fathers. I'm talking about everyone in the Old Testament. I worship the same God. Believing everything laid down in the law, that's the first five books of the Bible, the books Moses wrote, and written in the prophets, that's the rest of the Old Testament that was written by the prophets. These are shorthand terms. He's saying, I believe every single thing in the Old Testament that these Jews do who are accusing me, I believe everything that they believe. Having a hope in God which these men themselves accept, that there will be a resurrection of both the just and the unjust. He's quoting Daniel chapter 12, verse 2 specifically, but it's a big theme. At the end of everything, there will be a resurrection. Everyone who has died will come back and there will be a judgment. Those who are counted righteous before God will go into peace and splendor to behold the face of Jesus those who refuse Jesus and remain in their sins will go to hell and will receive the wrath of Jesus forever. They believed that in the Old Testament, though they wouldn't say it was Jesus. They would say it was the Christ, but they didn't think Jesus was the Christ. He said they believe this too. At the end, there's going to be a resurrection of both the just and the unjust. They know that those who are counted just, justified, righteous before God, we have this hope of this future resurrection. They know that. They believe it. And all I'm doing is telling you about what Daniel 12, 2 promises, what they believe. You see how he's arguing. So I always take pains to have a clear conscience toward both God and man. Now, after several years, I came to bring alms to my nation and to present offerings. So he came... After his missionary journeys, he came back to Jerusalem and he brought an offering to the church in Jerusalem because there had been a big famine. There wasn't enough food. So all these churches all throughout modern-day Turkey mostly had given alms, which means an offering for the poor, for those in need. And they had taken up this big collection to bring it to the church in Jerusalem to help feed the poor and those who are without food. So that's what he's saying. And I came to present offerings. He came to the temple to worship God. While I was doing this, they found me purified in the temple without any crowd or tumult. Purify meaning I did the necessary steps that you should do to make myself clean. I shaved my head. I was clean for seven days. I was outside of Gentile territory. He was being sensitive to the Mosaic law about how you should enter the temple. He's saying, I was in a purified state. I didn't come in filthy. I didn't like not wash like I was supposed to. I did everything how these Jews would say I'm supposed to. Everything. They found me purified without a crowd or tumult. But some Jews from Asia, they ought to be here before you and make an accusation should they have anything against me. Or else let these 
men themselves say what wrongdoing they found when I stood before the council. Other than this one thing that I cried out while standing among them, it is with respect to the resurrection of the dead that I am on trial before you this day. What Paul's doing, the big idea, he's been arrested. The Jews want to kill him because they're saying, you're preaching a false truth, a cult, starting something new. And Paul's before this Felix and saying, no, I didn't do any, they can't, they can't prove anything they're saying because it didn't happen like that. I wasn't unpurified. I wasn't defiling the temple. I'm not causing riots everywhere. I'm not, I'm not a cult leader, said Boba. I'll tell you what I am. I'm someone who can tell you the fulfillment of everything these guys believe in the Old Testament, and it's Jesus. That's what he's saying. He's saying there's no evidence to, that I've done any of this bad stuff. I've always labored to have a clear conscience before God and man. He's saying, but you need to know what I'm preaching, this way of Jesus, it's the ultimate fulfillment of everything. It's the ultimate fulfillment of the promise of the future resurrection. There is no disconnect between what I'm saying and what the Jews believe. They're just, he's saying, they're just stopping before Jesus. What I'm doing is showing the fulfillment of everything that they believe, and it's Jesus Christ. He's making a defense. Did you, did you even notice that he said that? I'm, I'm glad because I know you've been over this nation for years. I cheerfully make my defense. Paul's defending himself, and more importantly, he's actually just defending the gospel. So we need to know this happened, and Paul stands before this leader. Because Jesus even promised a couple chapters ago, he said, hey, you're going to be all right. Because I'm going to send you all the way to Rome, and you're going to go and testify to the truth of the gospel before a bunch of different leaders, all the way to Caesar, where we see he gets to the end of that, at the end of Acts. So we need to know that happened. But what does it mean for us? How do we look at this and see how do we apply that? What do we learn from Paul's example? And there are three things. We must defend the gospel. We must defend the gospel. Number two, how we can defend it. And number three, where we're going to get the courage to do it. We must defend the gospel. How can we? And how can we get the courage to actually do it? You learn all that right here. So start first thing. We must defend the gospel. A dog barks when his master is attacked, wrote Calvin about 500 years ago. I would be a coward if I saw that God's truth is attacked and yet would remain silent. Calvin was on to something. He said, a dog, a dog gets upset and barks and says, uh-uh, get away. You stop attacking my master. A dog does that. I would be a complete coward if I wouldn't even do for God when his truth is being assaulted, if I wouldn't even do what a dog does. He's right. Look at verse 10. Look what Paul does. He says, knowing, verse 10 in chapter 24, knowing that for many years you've been a judge over this nation, I cheerfully make my defense. I cheerfully make my apologia. That's where we get the word apologetics, meaning helping make a defense, helping give a reason for why we believe what we believe. He's defending himself, sure, but ultimately he's defending the gospel itself. Daryl Bach, who is a just basically whiz on the writings of Luke, you know, Luke wrote Luke, the gospel of Luke, and Acts. Luke wrote more content than any other New Testament writer. He only wrote two books. Paul wrote like 13. But Luke writes more than all of Paul's put together because Luke writes 24 chapters in the Gospel account of Luke and then 28 chapters in this book of Acts. He has a lot of content. And Daryl Bach is kind of the leading scholar on Luke's writings. And he, in his little commentary, he points something out that we need to really understand. He says, Luke, you know, who wrote Acts, spends more time on the defense speeches than he does on the missionary addresses. Saying Luke covers in, in Acts more of Paul 
defending the gospel than he does of Paul preaching the gospel on his missionary journeys. If you notice, we're in 20, about 22, then for 22 all the way through 28, there's a lot of content, and it's all just about Paul going from this leader, making a defense of the gospel, going to this leader, making a defense of the gospel, getting shipwrecked, getting to Rome, making a defense of the gospel. It's, there's more content in Acts about him defending it than him even preaching it. So Bach gets even more specific. He says there's 97 verses of defense speech and 47 verses of missionary speeches, like preaching. There are 239 prison verses and 226 missionary verses. Bach says this shows that Paul, the defender of the faith, is as important as Paul, the preacher of the faith. I think all Christians would agree that proclaiming the truth of the gospel, not only in this more formal way that I'm doing, that we do on Sundays through this kind of preaching, but in just communicating to people and talking to people about the gospel, I think we would all agree that is of utmost importance. People have to hear or read. They have The message of the gospel has to get to people. Paul says in Romans 10, if they don't hear the gospel, if they don't understand the good news of who Jesus is and what he's done, they will not be saved. God saves as his gospel is told or written, but people are getting in some way or another the message of who Jesus is, what he's done, that we should respond through faith in him for salvation. We'd say that is of utmost importance because if people don't hear that, they won't be saved. But do you see... Do you see just in the book of Acts what Luke is showing us? He's saying defending the truth of the gospel is just as, if not more important than preaching it. We get more of Paul defending it than of him preaching it, and we would do well to pay attention to that. Do you remember that place in 1 Peter 3 where Peter, the apostle, is writing on the authority of Jesus and says this, make a defense for the reason, if anyone asks for the reason of the hope that is in you, make a defense. Friends, Paul's doing, and he keeps doing throughout the rest of the book, exactly what the Apostle Peter commands us to do. He's defending the truth of the gospel. This is not a suggestion for you. This is a command from the Lord Jesus. Jesus, frankly, he doesn't make suggestions. He gives you marching orders. And if you know him, you're going to say, aye, aye, captain. Essentially, it's like, all right, you tell me what to do. I want to do what you want me to do. And don't forget that Peter, and we see it through the evidence or through the example of Paul, but you see it explicitly through Peter saying, make a defense of the gospel. It's a command. We must defend the gospel. This is not only for people who have kind of a love for apologetics or a love for answering critics. And there, there are some of you in this room right now that love that and love to be able to talk and wrestle with people through these things and defend the truth of the gospel. And there's some of you that go, I don't know how to do that at all. And I just freeze up and I don't. It's not just for those who are really into that kind of stuff. It's for every single Christian. It's a command. Make a defense. For anyone who ever asks for the reason of the hope that is in you. It's, Paul, it's Peter saying, you've got to be ready and you've got to defend the truth of the gospel. It matters. Just as if your wife or your best friend, if their name is being defamed or if people are lying about really who they are and what they've done, you want to stand up for them. Say, no, the, this is actually what the truth is. How dare we not do that if, like Calvin said, a dog barks when his master is attacked? I'd be a coward if I didn't do that when God's truth is attacked. Jesus says to you, make a defense. And we have the example of Paul here. And even looking at it, we see how, the next question should be, how can we do that? How do we do that well? well look at Paul. How did he do it? First, he knew the word of God. 
Look at verse 14 in chapter 24. But this I confess to you, that according to the way Christianity, which they call a sect, which they just call a cult, I worship the God of our fathers, believing everything laid down by the law and written in the prophets, having a hope in God, which these men themselves accept, that there will be a resurrection of both the just and the unjust. When Paul says, okay, here's brass tacks. I'm doing everything according to the Bible. He argues with Felix and with these against these accusations of the Jews straight from the word of God. He says, I believe everything that's written in the whole Old Testament and I'm actually preaching the fulfillment of what's promised there. He points them straight to Daniel 12 and he puts the burden of proof on these Jewish guys who are accusing him. He's saying, what are you going to do with Daniel 12? I can explain to you what that means. It's a big promise, right? Future resurrection, Jesus was resurrected. And all who are in him will be resurrected one day with him and like him. Paul says, I can tell you about that. It's in the Bible. That's his first line of defense. Always, Paul did what, exactly what Peter commands us, and how did he do it? He didn't have to Google it. He didn't have to say, you know, let me get back to you about that, which sometimes that's okay to do. He immediately just goes, "Uh uh-uh, here we go, the Bible. This is probably a summary of his speech, too, that he got later. So he probably went, maybe he went even more in depth, but he goes straight to the truth of God's Word. In 1 Peter 3.15, which I read that peace to you, make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. Right before that, Peter says, But in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense. So it's not just the command, make a defense. The command is also always, always, always be prepared to make a defense. How was Paul prepared? He knew the word of God. How can we be prepared like Paul, like Peter commands us to be? The simplest answer is to be as skillful as possible with the Bible. What what is called the sword of the Spirit. Think of the Scripture like a sword. How are you going to be skillful with the Bible to actually make a good defense for the truth of Christianity, the truth of the gospel? Well, how has a swordsman prepared prepared to defend himself? Picking up the sword, first of all. Swinging the sword, practicing, getting used to the balance, getting used to how to work with it. And third, using the sword. Pick it up, swing it, use it. So for, for us, we need to pick up the sword Devour the Word of God. Pick up your Bible. Devour it. Swing it. Read it so much that you start memorizing it. Use it. Talk to people about what God says in His Word. The burden of proof for anything you're arguing about is not on those who believe This is the Word of God. The burden of proof is not on you if you believe that. The burden of proof is actually on those who deny this is the Word of God. You want to search out the historical evidence for why we believe this is the Word of God? There's more evidence for that than just about anything else that people hold to. The burden of proof is not on us who would say, well, this is, we believe this is the Word of God. Friends, the burden of proof is on those who deny it. And so, Press them with it. Vody Bauckham, he's a pastor, a minister, brilliant guy, really, but he's talking about doing defense, like apologetics is the theological term, giving people a reason for the hope that is in you. He said, you know, we're in this modern day, and people, when they're trying to talk to others about Jesus, the other person would maybe say something like, You know, you would quote the Bible to them and they would say, well, you know, I don't believe the Bible's true. 
So then what a lot of guys do in that will just step away from the Bible and try to talk about it in some different way. And he said, well, that can help at times. You can help people think about presuppositions. Well, why, them, why are we here? And ask them all these questions. But Vody has something pretty good to say that we should all take into account. He says, imagine you're walking up to someone with a sword and they say, I don't believe in your sword. And you go, oh, okay. And you put the sword down. He said, that's not what you do. He said, cut them. I don't believe in your sword. Cut them with it. They'll believe in it. And what he's saying is, talk about the truth of the word of God. Like, I don't, I don't believe there is a God. Actually, Romans 1, Paul says the reason you don't believe in God is that you're suppressing that truth because you don't want there to be a God because you know if there is a God, you're accountable to that God. That's what Vodi says. Vodi says, don't put your sword down and say, I don't believe in your sword. It's like no person with a sword in real life would do that. He said, cut them with it. Charles Spurgeon was once asked, you know, how would you defend the Bible, Charles? And he was just brilliant and quick. He said, defend the Bible. It's like defending a lion. He said, I don't, you wouldn't defend a lion. You just need to open up the cage and it'll defend itself. What Spurgeon is saying is not that we shouldn't make a defense for the gospel, but he's saying the way that we do it is not by, well, let me tell you. He said, open the Bible, teach the Bible, tell people the Bible, cut them with the Bible. We need to know that if we are going to make a defense, first of all, you need to pick up the sword, swing the sword, use the sword. Spurgeon said, you need to unchain the lion. Do you know the Bible like that? Are you seeking to know the Bible like that? You want it to be written on your heart. You want to walk in what God says. You want to just know it, know it, know it for your own health and for the health of other people. Paul did. And that's why he was able to make a defense because he knew the word of God. The second thing we see Paul doing is that he made no unnecessary offense. He gave no unnecessary offense to other people. He's not in any way through all of his teachings coming up to people and just go, hey, you're stupid. Let me tell you why you're stupid. And I'm smarter than you. Paul never does that. He never just gives offensive language to people as he's explaining to them. You know, the other day, a friend and I were messaging back and forth because I'd asked him to write uh, a blog post or kind of an essay on this specific issue. And so we're sending links back to each other, like good things to investigate. And there was one website that I found. This guy had written a, a pretty good article on what we were talking about, except the content was good, but it was in a harsh, arrogant, just tone that is not going to help anyone who's trying to wrestle with the truth. It wasn't at all. And so I sent this link to my buddy, and he jokingly sent back, he said, uh, that's a good way to reach people. Uh, Hi, welcome to my website, I'm smarter than you.org. It wasn't the URL, but it was essentially that, and everything was written in a way, it's like, hey, I'm smarter than you, let me tell you why you're stupid, why I'm smart, and you should be like me. Paul's website URL, his address, would not be I'm smarter than you.org. He never did that. He was never condescending to people. He gave no unnecessary offense. He offended people like crazy, but not just because how he was. Look at verse 11. He says, You can verify that it is not more than 12 days since I went up to worship in Jerusalem. They did not find me disputing with anyone or stirring up a crowd, either in the temple or in the synagogues or in the city. It's like, I'm not trying to cause a bunch of riots. Neither, th neither can they prove to you what they now bring up against me. So, verse 16, So I always take pains to have a clear conscience toward both God and man. Now, after several years, I came to bring alms to my nation and present offerings. And while I was doing this, they found me purified in the temple without any crowd or tumult. I was saying, I'm not trying to cause riots. I went into the temple to worship, and these cleanliness laws in the Old Testament that they say we still need to abide by, they're fulfilled in Christ. 
this is kind of the subtext of what's going on. He said, but I didn't just say, I don't have to do that anymore. That part of the law is fulfilled in Christ. The cleanliness laws are gone. He didn't say that. He said, I purified myself like a good Jew would, and I went into the temple. He could have gone into the temple as he was and just gone, I'm free from the cleanliness laws in the Old Testament. I can come in here if I want. And no one could have said anything according to the truth of Jesus, but in order to not unnecessarily offend the people, he purified himself, shaved his head, made his body clean, and went in there. We have to know that as we talk to people about the gospel, as we defend the truth of the gospel, that it is offensive enough. The gospel itself is offensive. We don't need to add to the offense of the gospel by making it offensive by our personality or our rashness or our sharpness or our condescension. We need to know people, listen to them, sympathize with them, and answer with love gently and respectfully. You know, that's like 1 Peter 3.15. We keep going back there because it's giving us this guidance in all of it. Always be prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for the reason that the hope that is in you. Yet, do it with gentleness and respect, having a good conscience, so that when you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ may be put to shame. Saying, as we make a defense of the gospel, you got to be prepared, you got to make a defense, but you've got to do it with gentleness and respect, with a clear conscience. How can we defend the gospel? Well, second of all, by not giving any unnecessary offense to anyone. And third, and finally, how can we defend it? How did Paul do it? He always, always got to Jesus. Paul is never just vaguely talking about the truth of the Word of God, but he's always getting to Jesus. We get a little summary of his defense here. If you go back just a chapter, and why he was arrested, what was he doing? He was preaching Christ. Our passage next week that Pastor James will be preaching to you, what's he doing with Felix and Felix's wife? He's preaching Christ. He doesn't just vaguely talk about the Bible, but he preaches Jesus. As I've mentioned before, and will mention again and again, to talk about the Bible, to make any kind of defense for the truth of the Word of God or the gospel itself without aiming wholeheartedly to get to Jesus is as pointless as talking about Metropolis without aiming to get to Superman. The whole point of Metropolis is to reveal how awesome Superman is. So the whole point of your whole Bible, the point of this, everything in it, is to reveal the glory of Jesus Christ. He is the sum total about what this is about. So as you talk to people, you've got to get to Jesus. There is no power in Moses. There's no power in David. There's no power in just simply believing that God exists. There's no power in believing truth actually exists. There is no power in anything or anyone but Jesus and his gospel. Paul doesn't say having a right view of the truth is the power of God for salvation. He doesn't say, you know, believing God exists is the power of God for salvation. What does he say in Romans 1.16? The gospel is the power of God for salvation for all who believe. You've got to get to Jesus. You've got to aim in every way that whatever question is being asked, you're trying to find a road to get, just get to the gospel. Get to Jesus. Use the Bible. Don't give unnecessary offense. And you've got to get to Jesus. How are we going to do it? We could end here and say, well, hey, there's your marching orders. Go do it. Know the Bible. Don't give offense. Always get to Jesus. Go. It's not good enough. How are we going to do that? 
How are we going to get the courage to be able to do that? Here's how. This story should remind us of another innocent man who was on trial for crimes he didn't commit. Are you reminded of that when you see Paul given a defense? It's like he's on trial. He didn't even commit these crimes. Jesus was put on trial. He didn't commit the crimes they brought against him. But he didn't defend himself. Why? Why does Isaiah 53 say, Jesus was led like a lamb to the slaughter, but he was silent and opened not his mouth? Why is Jesus the only sinless man to ever live? Standing before this council, being falsely accused, and he doesn't open his mouth. He doesn't do what Paul does. He doesn't make a defense. Why? Because of you. Because Jesus, his ultimate aim, the reason he didn't defend himself is because he went to a cross to defend you. That's how much he loves you. Jesus kept his mouth shut when he's being falsely accused, so he would be carried, nailed to wood, and take the judgment and wrath of God for you. You see, Jesus didn't defend himself so he could defend you. That's what Paul gets. That's what Paul knows. Paul knows, since Jesus lived and died for me, since Jesus ultimately defended me, I'm safe. And so I can do whatever I need to do to defend him and defend his gospel. If you do that, sometimes it will go really well for you. If you really stand up boldly and defend the truth of the word, defend the truth of the gospel, think about Daniel. The king said, can't pray to anybody but me. Daniel's like, meh, still going to pray. <laughs> Opens up his windows, still prays. What does the king do with him? He throws him in a den of lions. And the Lord shut the lion's mouth so that Daniel hangs out there all night with these lions and their mouths are shut and they don't eat them. That's awesome. Daniel stands up for the truth. It turns out pretty well for him. Think about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They don't bow down to worship the idol that Nebuchadnezzar had set up. And what happens to them? They get thrown in a fiery furnace, heated hotter than it had ever been heated up, and they get burned alive. No, they didn't. They came out without a burn. There was a fourth person standing in the fire with them. Jesus appears there with them, protects them. Turned out really well for them. Think about Peter at Pentecost. Peter stands up boldly, says, This is the truth of the word. David can't save you. Jesus can come to him. 3,000 people got saved. Think about Paul and a lot of his missionary journeys. He planted churches all over the place. Things went well sometimes. Sometimes it'll go really well for you. And sometimes it'll go really badly. So Jeremiah was beaten and put in stocks. Isaiah was sawn in two with a wooden saw. Peter, in a few years, will be crucified. John the Baptist had his head cut off. Stephen was stoned to death. A few years after this, Paul's writing this in 80, or Luke's writing this, covering what happened in AD 57, about AD 65, Paul has walked outside of his prison cell, knelt down, and with the swift swing of the sword, his head is off. Sometimes it will go really well for you, and sometimes it will go really badly for you. And you, if you're in Christ, will always be as safe as you can possibly be. To live is Christ. To die is gain. The worst thing can, that can happen to us is get killed. Paul says, you kill me, I'm just going to go be with Jesus. You're doing the best thing that can actually happen. And Paul was fearless and bold because he knew, essentially, I'm invincible until the work Jesus has given me to do is done. That's why I said things like, Jesus, in Ephesians 1, works all things according to the purpose of his will. I was like, Jesus has got this. I'm just going to be faithful. 
That's why he said Romans 8, 28. I, we know for, for all who love God and are called according to his purpose, all things work together for good. Like, I'm invincible until Jesus is done with me. I'm not going to be stupid, but I don't have to worry about what's going to happen. Sometimes it's going to go good. Sometimes it's going to be bad. But he's safe. His sin's paid for. He's counted righteous before God. He dies, he goes to be with Jesus. And when you, and only when you see and trust that Jesus kept his mouth shut to defend you and go to the cross and save you, then and only then, when that's the center of your life, only then will you have the courage, will you have the boldness, will you have the strength to open your mouth and speak up and defend his gospel. Pray with me. Father, thank you for your love. Thank you for who Jesus is and what he's done. Give us the strength and courage and boldness to know the word. Give no unnecessary offense and to always get to Jesus. Help us to quit playing games and quit being children to be devouring your word and telling people your gospel so that they may be saved. We ask you to do what we cannot do. Save those who don't yet know you through Jesus in a saving way and sanctify us, change us, make us more like Jesus who already know him. It's in his name we pray. Amen.